1962, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko introduced Spider-Man, breaking new ground by making the character significantly younger than most other superheroes. Typically, characters of Peter Parker's age would have been sidekicks, but Spider-Man fought crime his own way, often without assistance and ultimately responsible for his own success or failure. He's remained one of the most popular and beloved superheroes for decades, with many portrayals spotlighting how difficult it is for Spidey to balance his daily heroics with jobs, school, relationships, financial problems, and everything else a young man has to face. He also struggles with feelings of inadequacy, and if he's taking the quality of his video games into account, well, he might actually be onto something. Today, we'll take a look at every one of them and rank them from worst to best. We'll consider how innovative they were at release, how well they've held up since, and how much they actually have anything to do with Spider-Man, which shouldn't be a concern, but as you'll see, definitely is. As always, we have a few ground rules, and they'll be very much in line with what we established for our list of Batman games. That is to say, we're excluding mobile games, online flash games, handheld LCD games, and one-off plug-and-play games, because I don't want this in my house. Secondly, if the game isn't truly about Spider-Man, we won't include it. That sounds like it should go without saying, but there are a huge number of Marvel games marketed as featuring Spider-Man when his role is more of a cameo, so we'll be ignoring those for now. We are, however, including games in which Spider-Man shares equal billing. And finally, we will not be ranking Spider-Man's educational games, largely because we really don't want to. Let's rank them. I'm Peter. And I'm Ben from Triple Jump. And this is every Spider-Man video game ranked from worst to best. Number 57, The Amazing Spider-Man Web of Fire. 32X. Web of Fire was released after Sega announced they would no longer support the 32X, which led to the game only having around 15,000 copies produced. We're glad we aren't collectors, because if we paid around $2,000 for this, we'd be institutionalized. The game's animation and soundtrack are fine, but the developers seem to believe that Spider-Man's superpower is running annoyingly fast on surfaces made of butter. Controlling him is both slippery and requires superhuman reflexes. Walking really shouldn't be this challenging for Peter Parker. Spider-Man in this game also has the irritating tendency to cling to the sides of obstacles that are a fraction of his own height, and the level designers somehow got it into their heads that every platforming section should consist of nothing but blind jumps. The first stage does end with Spider-Man punching Dragon Man's head cleanly off his body, though, so, you know, that's nice. Number 56. Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge. Game Boy and Game Gear. It's never a good sign when a game's box art can't get its own title right, and sure enough, Spider-Man and the X-Men in The Return of the Curse of the Creature's Ghost is a gigantic mess. It's not exclusively a Spider-Man game, but seeing as no human being will play beyond his opening level before calmly destroying the cartridge with a hammer, we're counting it. Spider-Man animates and controls like he's just eaten a three-day-old sausage roll, and the opening bomb deactivation stage appears to have been scientifically designed to be as frustrating as possible. The developers included a Spidey Sense indicator at the bottom right of the screen, which seems like a nice touch until you realize it's because they couldn't even design a basic left-to-right platformer without resorting to clunky waypointing. The game doesn't get any better from here, unless you turn it off, at which point the experience improves substantially. Number 55. Spider-Man. Hyperscan. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Does whatever a hypers... can't... hyperscan. Yes, Spider-Man had the misfortune of appearing on Mattel's legendarily terrible hyperscan. It was one of the first five games released for the system, making it... and uh, let me just check my notes here. Oh yes, uh, one of the last five games released for the system. It comes with all of the Hyperscan's predictable issues. Maddening loading times, a reliance on scannable cards, a number of which were never even released, and the fact that the console itself often refused just, just refused to work. Actually, having said that, that's probably the Hyperscan's best feature. 
got him. The fact that the controls are barely responsive is more or less a given, but we do have to wonder why Spider-Man himself is the size of a broken toenail. I know, sorry to nitpick, we just tend to prefer it when the camera is in the same time zone as our protagonist. Number 54. The Amazing Spider-Man and Captain America in Doctor Doom's Revenge Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Commodore 64, MS-DOS, and ZX Spectrum. Spider-Man and Captain America are two very different kinds of heroes with very different abilities. Don't worry though, in this game they're equally dull to control. The game is split into a series of one-on-one -on -one fights and superhero challenges, meaning for half of the game you punch and for the other half of the game you jump. Not sure who told the developers that those two actions qualify as separate game modes, but here we are. You control Captain America at the start, which means you'll be bored to tears long before you even get to play as Spider-Man. Critics at the time didn't exactly shower the game with praise, but they did have a few nice things to say about the way it looked and sounded. Seeing as the game looked and sounded different in each of its six versions, though that's hardly a recommendation for the game as a whole. Number 53. Spider-Man 2. Mac and PC. If you remember Spider-Man 2 being a good game, you clearly didn't play the PC version later ported to Mac. It still has some of the Bruce Campbell narration, the only reason it's as high on this list as it is, but that is the only thing it has in common with the PlayStation 2 game of the same name. This version of Spider-Man 2 is an almost insultingly buggy mess, made all the more surprising by the fact that much of the gameplay boils down to simple quick-time events. There was so much less to go wrong here, so why does it play like an ancient curse? Enemies spawn on the wrong plane of existence, characters disappear, the game has no idea what to do with its own physics, and characters are about as animated as Hummel figurines. Now let's go back to never, ever speaking of this game again. Number 52. Spider-Man – Return of the Sinister Six – Game Gear We don't expect much from the Sega Game Gear, but we have to admit we prefer games that you know, react to the buttons we press. Return of the Sinister Six is so stiff and unresponsive it feels like our older sibling has given us an unplugged controller to shut us up. Or maybe that was just me. The game honestly feels distracted, like it's trying to remember that girl it had to leave behind in Normandy when the war was won, but you keep interrupting it. Spider-Man needs to crouch to collect coins, and heaven help you if you're just a pixel away from where the game would prefer you to be. He can climb walls in the background, except for the ones that he inexplicably can't, and if you press the attack button, Spider-Man will absolutely take your suggestion on board and really give it some solid consideration. Also, you only get one life. Actually, that's true outside of the game as well, so please, please spend it playing something else. Number 51. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 3DS It's audacious how little The Amazing Spider-Man 2 for the 3DS even bothers to try. It's as though it was built by felons who managed to get game design to count as community service. The story is that Spider-Man beats someone up, then takes a few steps to beat somebody else up, then keeps doing this until there is nobody left to beat up. A classic tale, we will admit, but it makes for a far from memorable experience. The combat and platforming manage to be even more boring than they look, and the visual design is little more than a test of how many different shades of grey the 3DS can produce. Enemies are grey, environments are grey, backgrounds are grey, walls are grey. If it weren't for the colours of Spider-Man's costume, this game would be a great way to trick your friends into thinking they went suddenly colourblind. Number 50. Spider-Man 3 – Invasion of the Spider-Slayers Game Boy First impressions are important, which is why Invasion of the Spider-Slayers opens with the worst first level in gaming history. We've got to admire the developer's honesty, really. The game starts with Spider-Man having to stop 20 muggers. At least, the game calls them muggers. They aren't actually mugging anyone. They're pulling firearms out of their coats and firing blindly. You'll wander back and forth, waiting for someone to spawn. Then you'll have to wait even longer to see if he has a gun. And while you do this, children on skateboards eat away at your health. And oh, did we mention there's a time limit and you'll have to start from the beginning when it expires? Come to think of it, Spider-Man shouldn't really be worried about spider slayers at all, being as he's not actually a spider. You know what you should be worried about, Pete? 20 active shooters in a park! Number 49. Quest Probe featuring Spider-Man. Acorn Electron, Atari 8-Bit, BBC Micro, Commodore 64, Dragon 32, MS-DOS, MSX, and ZX Spectrum. 
Intended to be a 12-game series with each installment focusing on different superheroes, Quest Probe ended after only three entries. Unfortunately for Spider-Man, that mercy killing came too late. Quest Probe featuring Spider-Man existed in a number of different versions, with the only real difference being the quality of their graphics. As the gameplay consists entirely of text inputs, though, that's largely irrelevant. Nothing about this game is specific to Spider-Man. In fact, the entire adventure – we use the word loosely – takes place within a single, nondescript building. You explore it and solve various simple puzzles to collect gems for no reason whatsoever. Baddies show up over the course of the game, but you won't be fighting any of them. They just represent further puzzles to be solved. We will, however, give the game credit for including one very innovative feature. With just a few keystrokes, you can convince Spider-Man to not be alive anymore. He's nothing if not accommodating. Number 48. Spider-Man 2. Engage. Have you ever played Spider-Man 2 on the PlayStation 2 and thought, hmm, this is fine, but I wish the controls were worse and it was really difficult to see? If so, the end gauge as you covered. Well, alright, it's not exactly the same game. It's definitely been scaled down and redesigned and made awful, to be frank. It's stiff, confusing, and has the same frame rate of an actual comic book. Loading times regularly exceed 30 seconds as well, just to ensure the game sapped the maximum amount of life away from those unfortunate enough to play it, but we will say that it's genuinely impressive that any version of Spider-Man 2 existed on an N-Gage, a handheld system after all less powerful than the microchip in your dog. But beyond that, it's probably most notable for being mocked by Ed Helms on The Daily Show. Number 47. The Amazing Spider-Man. Amiga, Atari ST, Commodore 64, and MS-DOS. This is… Uh, a thing? That's about all I can say with certainty, to be honest. It's a sort of maze game? It takes place across a number of interconnected themed stages, each with a different title displayed on screen. It's a, a bit like Manic Miner or Jet Set Willy, but somehow even stranger. The game might take place in outer space, or, or it, it could just be nighttime. But either way, gravity here works like it does nowhere else in the known universe, so it probably doesn't matter. Spider-Man does whatever a spider can, so long as the spiders you know can walk around flipping switches and outwitting mummies. There is, however, a story here involving Mysterio kidnapping Mary Jane, but I think one look at the footage is all it takes to realise any narrative logic must have been forcibly applied after the fact. Number 46. Spider-Man Mysterio's Menace – Game Boy Advance from the muddy graphics to the repetitive combat to the same three-second bass loop that drones endlessly through every stage, Mysterio's Menace seems to have been designed for the sole purpose of giving players a Mysterio's migraine. Nothing about the game feels as though it's received any amount of polish, and even simple things such as picking up items feels finicky and untested. Spider-Man's moveset is almost comically dull, and every single enemy gets its own health bar, ensuring you're always acutely aware of just how tedious each encounter is. We will give credit where it's due, the web swinging works well enough, and there are a number of minor jumping puzzles throughout the experience, something you'd really think we'd see a lot more of in Spider-Man games. You can also choose which level to play next at certain points, meaning every time you replay it, you'll get to hate them in a different order. Number 45. Spider-Man 2 – DS why is it that the great, some might even say amazing, Spider-Man 2 on the PlayStation 2 got so many terrible equivalents on other systems? The answer, of course, is that they were handled by separate developers working with completely different hardware, but my question was meant to be rhetorical, so sit down, please. The DS version of Spider-Man is a side-scrolling beat-em-up, which just so happens to control horrendously and look even worse. It's not the ugliest game on this list, just ugliest than most, but it certainly looks lifeless, and it's one that's had absolutely no attempt to inject it with personality. Just a peek at the combat and its big, empty stages reveal how little care went into this. Unless you live in some region of the world that obligates you by law to purchase this game, we can't recommend it, and even then it's probably best that you move. Number 44. Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage – SNES and Mega Drive 
Beat-em-ups don't need to do much in order to be fun, but they certainly need to do more than this. The game consists entirely of taking a few steps, waiting for waves of repetitive, uninteresting enemies to spawn, fighting them, and then repeating the process. Words cannot convey how utterly boring it is. It's not especially difficult, but every time you think a particular brawl should be winding up about now, it makes sure to continue well beyond the bounds of decency. Then you shuffle forward and do exactly the same thing with exactly the same enemies all over again. You can choose to play as Venom, which you'd think would add some interesting wrinkles to the game by default, but no, same plot, same stages, same enemies. He's just a palette swap, right down to having the same moves as Spider-Man. They must have been as bored making this game as we were playing it. Number 43. Venom slash Spider-Man Separation Anxiety. SNES, Mega Drive, and PC. This is, uh, the same game. Like, literally the same game we just talked about, just with a different name and a few very, very minor tweaks. Just like Maximum Carnage, Venom slash Spider hyphen man colon separation anxiety takes the already boring idea of Spider-Man walking down the street punching people and manages to fail to live up to even those low expectations. Once again, the fighting isn't even executed well. Typically, brawlers will give you a little bit of vertical leeway, since lining yourself up pixel perfectly with your enemy would be finicky to the point of distraction. Here, though, there's no leeway. If you're just a hair too far north or south of your opponent, you'll be swinging away at the empty air. How in the world Acclaim had the gall to release the same game twice, right down to the locations and enemies within one year of each other, is beyond us. Number 42, Spider-Man 2 Game Boy Advance. If you ever wanted to play a Spider-Man game in which our hero controls like a sack of bowling balls, this is the game for you. Everything about the experience feels clunky, and we're still not sure if the game suffers from input delay or just excessively slow animations. Perhaps it's both. The game is optimised very poorly, with swinging from webs, for example, nearly always introducing a full second or more of slowdown. Down. But, you know, maybe we're just nitpicking here. I mean, who'd ever want to swing from webs in a Spider-Man game anyway? It's a very glitchy experience. We got stuck in ceilings and phased through solid walls a number of times. We've certainly seen worse, many times on this very list in fact, but every bit of the presentation just feels a bit off, such as Spider-Man making a sound like he's passing a kidney stone every time he jumps. <laughs> Number 41, The Amazing Spider-Man, Nintendo DS. As we'll see much later, the proper Amazing Spider-Man film tie-in was ported more or less intact to the 3DS. Whose idea was it then to create a far inferior version for a dead system? To start with the good aspects of the game, it controls fine. Also, it... No, actually, no, that's that's about it. Sorry for using aspects as plural there. That was very misleading now I think about it. The game rarely aspires to more than having you fight your way through baddies until you find a key to a door, at which point you fight through baddies looking for another key to a door. It's the very definition of an inessential game. There is nothing redeeming here aside from... I don't know, the fact that when you die in the game, you don't die in real life? I mean, that's a plus. Number 40, Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin, Master System and Game Gear. Spider-Man fans had a fair number of titles to choose from on Sega consoles, but of course picking one is about as pleasant a choice as selecting the manner of your own execution. But still, variety's nice, right? Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin is artfully misleading. It makes you believe that your main struggle in this game will be against the bald cigar aficionado Kingpin. And by that I mean he's a cigar aficionado who is bald, by the way. He's not an aficionado of bald cigars. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's not actually Kingpin who is the main villain in this game. It's the controls. Spider-Man pops on and off surfaces that he should be able to climb very easily, and only periodically will the game allow you to shot web, as though Spider-Man can't control this ability any better than he can control a sneeze. Number 39, Spider-Man Edge of Time, Nintendo DS. This version of Edge of Time is a platformer that unfolds over a series of interconnected areas, something we'd call Metroidvania if that wouldn't cause irreparable offence to the genre. 
The areas don't really stand out, which is a crucial failing in this kind of game. Granted, Edge of Time has a map, which helps a lot, but players should at least partially be able to navigate via visual landmarks. Of course, the gameplay might still be fun, even if the exploration isn't, right? No, we're still deep in the dredges of this list, so I think you know that that's not the case. Enemies are too easily avoided to present any kind of real obstacle, and they're dispatched easily enough with your basic attacks so that the power-ups never feel as satisfying as they should. This is definitely the worst version of Edge of Time, and Edge of Time wasn't really that great in the first place. Number 38, Spider-Man, Friend or Foe, DS and PSP. Technically, these are two different games that share a title, but we'd have to put them back to back anyway, as they also share the same strengths and weaknesses. In each version, you'll combine forces with a friend or foe, an ally or adversary, a companion or a criminal, a buddy or a bully from within the Spider-Man universe, and fight your way through stages that, to be frank, should be far more varied than they really are. It's an excellent concept for a game, but it rarely feels tailored to the these characters at all. The DS version offers a vertically oriented feel of play, with the ability to move between both screens to fight baddies and accomplish objectives, and it also has the requisite touchscreen minigames. Whether these things qualify as a bonus or a drawback comes down to personal taste, but let's be clear, it is a drawback. It's definitely a drawback. Just forget what I just said, it's definitely a drawback. Number 37, Spider-Man. SNES. One of the best things about Spider-Man for the SNES is that it opens with the 1994 cartoon series theme song. One of the worst things about Spider-Man for the SNES is that this theme song sounds like it's being fed through the acoustics of hell. Ten hour loop when? YouTube? Anyway, Spider Man is not good. And it doesn't seem to understand who Spider Man is, actually. Here's a hint he's not a walking tank. Just look at this absolute unit. Of course, a Spider Man built like a brick. Um, stink house doesn't necessarily make for a bad game. Never fear though, because everything else about the game does. For instance, objectives are needlessly obtuse. You can't smash your way through this grate. Fine, so you head off to look for some other way of opening it. Instead though, you have to destroy a completely unrelated robot. Once you do that, the grate can suddenly be smashed. There is no logical way for a player to make that connection because, well, there isn't a connection. Anyway, have fun working out the rest of the game. Number 36, Spider-Man Battle for New York, Game Boy Advance. Battle for New York seems to actively dare you to enjoy it. For starters, it doesn't even let you play as Spider-Man until you complete a series of extremely tedious levels as Green Goblin. Don't get us wrong, playing as a supervillain should be fun, but here it feels more like a chore. You search for keys and light Bunsen burners to progress, because, you know, that's definitely the only stuff you'd ever want to do as a gigantic monster in a video game. Admittedly, you do get to punch passers-by to death, but even that feels a little pedestrian. <laughs> That's good wordplay, trust me, you'll laugh tomorrow. Playing as Spider-Man is more fun by default, but it's still not great, and you're periodically punished by having to play as the Green Goblin again. For a game about the inevitable collision between good and evil, Battle for New York succeeds in only convincing us uh, we don't care who wins, we don't even want to be involved. Number 35, Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six, NES and Master System. Return of the Sinister Six on the NES is quite similar to the Game Gear version, with the notable difference though that this one is playable. Spider-Man even has some additional moves in this build, which is odd as the NES had the same number of buttons as the Game Gear. In addition, the hitboxes are better defined and the boss fights are better balanced. The stage design is still rather uninspired though, and there's at least one area in the Sandman Zone that softlocks the game if you happen to stumble into it. On the bright side, the game does an excellent job of capturing Peter Parker's famous 20-foot vertical, and when you punch people, they explode into showers of burnt meat. Keep in mind, of course, that the Master System version of this game is almost identical, so don't accidentally play that one either. 
Number 34, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Game Boy. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was released in North America simply as Spider-Man 2, a tacit admission if ever we've heard one. We'll give it a bit of respect for trying new things as a sequel, and we'll discuss its predecessor in a bit, but it's difficult to argue that it did any of those new things amazingly well. This game tasks Spider-Man with exploring larger levels to find objects and complete objectives. It's no longer as simple as moving to the right and punching a boss. The problem is, though, that those levels aren't much fun to explore, and the objectives are rarely clear. Players will experience a lot of backtracking, further hampered by respawning enemies and frequent slowdown. Still though, it tried, and the soundtrack isn't half bad, so there's that. Number 33, Spider-Man Web of Shadows, DS. Web of Shadows exists in a few different versions, and this one is safely the worst. It's the sort of game you can assume can't be boring forever, and then it works really hard to prove you wrong. One very nice thing about the game is that the combat and web-slinging are both smoothly executed. They're never fun, mind you, but they work well and deserve a much better game built around them. Here, Spider-Man fights anonymous baddies on flat planes, and though he gains abilities that allow him to access new parts of the map, none of them really feel worth exploring. There are multiple endings, if two counts as multiple, so that's something. Also, when you die, you get to play a touchscreen minigame to revive yourself, which is a unique feature because no other game in history was stupid enough to include one. Number 32, Spider-Man Mega Drive. At first glance, this looks like the SNES game of the same name, but it's actually quite a lot different, with redesigned stages, clearer objectives, and slightly improved controls. All of this adds up to a much better game, although to be clear, it's still not good by any stretch of the imagination. Spider-Man moves a bit more fluidly here, controlling less like a brick, and more of a… a sort of mound of boiled beef. The animations are also nicer, though the stages are often too busy visually, and there's no clear way of telling which walls are climbable and which objects you can walk through. Our favourite part of this game, though, is the death animation, which makes it look like Spider-Man is deflating. If you would like to re-inflate him afterwards, just, uh, <laughs> promise us you won't use your mouth. Number 31, Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge, the SNES. It says a lot when I assume somebody playtested it counts as a recommendation, but so it goes in the world of Spider-Man games. Much like the Game Boy game of the same name, the SNES version is hot garbage, but here at least, the opening stage is actually completable without exhausting your entire stock of profanity. The Spidey Sense returns, but this time with an obnoxious oral cue that makes it sound more like Spidey Flatulence. The stage may be easier to traverse, but the developers made sure it would be no more pleasant. Beyond that, the game opens up substantially. Spider-Man can continue on his adventure, but you also get the option to play as four of the X-Men, or X-Women, through their own stages. It's worth noting that the Mega Drive version, released the following year, has an improved soundtrack, not least because the Spidey Sense is now completely silent. Uh, possibly still deadly though, so look out. Number 30, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, Wii U, Xbox 360, Xbox One, and PC. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was released on a series of platforms with a wide range of processing power, so in a strict sense, it's impressive that all the versions look, feel, and play very similarly to each other. They don't do any of those things well, mind, but, you know, points for consistency, I guess. Every version suffered from glitches, technical issues, and slowdown, with performance only ever stabilizing long enough for players to realize the game wasn't any good. The critical consensus was that it was a less interesting and barely functional version of previous Spider-Man titles, some of which were actually developed by the same team, making this big step backwards even more puzzling. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was so disappointing, it caused Polygon to lament that there would probably never be a truly great Spider-Man game. That provides a good idea of just how cold this one left Spidey's fans. Number 29, Spider-Man Battle for New York, DS. 
We know it's not saying much that the DS version of Battle for New York is better than the Game Boy Advance version, but it's the most we can say, so you'll have to just live with it. The animation has been improved, the controls feel a bit better, and the cutscenes feature voice acting. Not good voice acting, but that's sort of why we love it, to be honest. A few of the objectives make more sense than they did in the Game Boy Advance version as well, such as Green Goblin actually, you know, smashing stuff up, as opposed to breaking into Peter Parker's school to, uh, light candles. Spider-Man and Green Goblin have both been given special moves accessible via touchscreen, and because I used the word touchscreen, you can can be certain this version of Battle for New York contains unnecessary mini-games. It is an improvement, but we certainly wish it were more of one. Number 28, Spider-Man, Atari 2600. This one isn't remembered with much fondness, but it's better than its reputation suggests. You scale buildings with your webbing, though the sound effects make it sound like Peter Parker is vomiting. <laughs> and try to reach the top where Green Goblin has planted some bombs. That's pretty much it, really. But there is more depth than meets the eye. If a criminal in one of the many windows severs your web, you'll fall. But if you touch them physically, ooh, steady on, you'll get points for apprehending them. Grabbing bombs also nets you some points, but if you wait until they're about to explode, you'll earn even more. And when you're falling, you can grab back onto the building and save yourself. You know, just like Spider-Man. Or you can just let Spidey fall and break his spine. Oh yeah, he's he's never walking again. If you ever wonder how Spider-Man has been treated overall by the industry, just remember that this game, this game, is better than a full half of his other outings. Oh dear. Number 27. Spider-Man Friend or Foe. PlayStation 2, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC. Spider-Man is recruited by Nick Fury to seek out pieces of the meteor that brought the Venom symbiote to Earth, forcing our two-legged, eight-legged friend to team up with friendly and not-so-friendly faces from his past in a globe-trotting co-op adventure. That's the concept behind Spider-Man Friend or Foe, and as a concept, we couldn't ask for much more. As a game, however, well... It's something of an achievement to have squandered so much potential. Spider-Man's global adventure unfolds over only five areas, a mere 20 stages in total, and the combat is tedious from the get-go. What's more, you never really get to use anybody's special abilities outside of predetermined moments. Sure, their punches and kicks all look different, but that's hardly what should set them apart as characters, and friend or foe stands as little more than a testament to the failure of imagination. Number 26. The Amazing Spider-Man. Game Boy. At last, a side-scroller that actually does the things we like side-scrollers to do. It's not exciting or innovative in any way, but it's competent, and at this point I see this as an absolute win. Wait, wrong Avenger. Let's start again. This game isn't anything revolutionary, but it has its heart in the right place. Spider-Man may spend most of his time slapping anonymous baddies around, and he may look like he's played by Napoleon Dynamite, but swinging through the air works quite well, and it's a fair amount of fun. The best part of the game is the soundtrack by the legendary David Wise, but there's also some truly enjoyable cheese. For instance, in this scene, Spider-Man laments that Mysterio didn't give him any useful information. We'd lament right alongside you, Pete, but we watched you blow him up instead of asking him any questions, so frankly, we think this one is on you. Number 25. Spider-Man Web of Shadows. PlayStation 2 and PlayStation Portable. When Web of Shadows was released for the PS3, Xbox 360, and the Wii, it was pretty clear which system would get a downgraded version. What wasn't clear was what the PS2 would get. Would it be the faithful but less visually impressive Wii version, or would it be the completely different, far inferior beat-em-up that the PSP was getting? It was, of course, the PSP version that nobody wanted in the first place. It was a good way of punishing anyone who hadn't upgraded to the new console generation, we, we suppose. This version does at least pay lip service to the main game's basic morality system, allowing players to choose between different lines of dialogue, but that's of little comfort and not much of a selling point. On the positive side, players can summon 30 different allies to help them fight more than the main game offers. On the less positive side, though, is everything else. Number 24. Spider-Man 3. DS. 
No version of Spider-Man 3 is particularly good, and we're definitely including the film version in this statement, but the DS version is likely the worst. It's one of many games on this list that reduces Spider-Man to running back and forth while punching people, and it's also one that can't rely on looking good, sounding good, or controlling well. Nintendo's consoles get a lot of guff, sometimes well-deserved, for breeding games that make poor, mandatory use of control gimmicks. Spider-Man 3 is one of those games, requiring touchscreen input for attacking and webbing enemies. The best DS games use the touchscreen either sparingly or wisely. Spider-Man 3 uses it constantly and idiotic. If you can adjust to the controls, you'll find a perfectly competent game underneath, but the time you spend adjusting could be much better spent with any of the remaining games on this list. Number 23. The Amazing Spider-Man – Lethal Foes Super Famicom one of the better-looking 16-bit Spider-Man games, Lethal Foes is an overall proficient yet thoroughly forgettable adventure. It's a by-the-numbers platformer slash brawler with just a bit of web-slinging thrown in. The controls are clunky and Spider-Man is nowhere near as responsive as he should be. It's nothing you can't adjust to, but the fact that each stage has a fairly strict timer means that you don't really have enough time to adjust. Those who are willing to stick with it and master it will probably have a decent enough time, but we certainly won't blame anyone who bails on it in favour of some something better. Lethal Foes never left Japan, which means no official English version exists, and that's fine, because no translated version could ever be as entertaining as seeing J. Jonah Jameson shouting in Japanese about pictures of Spider-Man. I mean, it's fairly safe to assume that's what he's shouting about, right? Spider-Man! Number 22. Ultimate Spider-Man DS A console Spider-Man game got a disappointing handheld equivalent called the Daily Bugle! I'm joking, of course, it's not surprising at all, and the Daily Bugle is a fictional newspaper that only exists within the world of Spider-Man and therefore cannot accept your call, you fool. Spider -Man. Ultimate Spider-Man is less a bad game than it is a thoroughly inessential one. It looks fine, plays fine, and sounds fine, but it never gets much further than that. The Venom stages are welcome, there's something automatically satisfying about SUCKING THE LIFE OUT OF INNOCENCE on a Nintendo handheld, but the Spider-Man stages sometimes involve timed puzzles with unclear solutions, which is basically a recipe for frustration. One nice detail is that while playing as Spider-Man, you focus on the top screen, and while playing as Venom, you focus on the bottom. That's the most creativity demonstrated in the entire game, however. Number 21. Spider-Man 3 – Game Boy Advance there's little about Spider-Man 3 on the Game Boy Advance that sets it apart, though it is at least a competently made little adventure. It's a decent time waster, but nothing we imagine will bring people back again and again. On the negative side, the fighting could do with being much quicker. Also, a few moves that should be basic, such as dashing and evading, require some pretty uncomfortable fingerings Quiet back there! to pull off. I, I said quiet back there! The puzzles, such as they are, also don't extend beyond finding a key or a switch to open the next passage. On the bright side, though, there are some nice-looking sequences, such as an early fight that takes place atop moving vehicles. You can also upgrade Spider-Man with permanent power-ups, giving the experience a genuine feel of progression. But if you have a Game Boy Advance, you can do better than this, for instance. Number 20. Spider-Man. Game Boy Advance. Many Spider-Man games paint our hero as a brawler, which leads them to feel untrue to the character. In fact, Spider-Man's lack of brutality is what clues Mary Jane into the fact that the vicious Craven the Hunter has replaced Peter Parker in Craven's Last Hunt. Yes, Spider-Man physically beating people to a pulp is so far outside the character's normal behaviour that it should serve as a canonical red flag. Spider-Man for the Game Boy Advance, though, is smarter than that. The bulk of the game is designed around swinging, climbing, and crawling through tight areas. It's one of only a few games on this list that actually asks, how can we make a game for Spider-Man, as opposed to, how can we put Spider-Man in a game? The boss fights can be quite annoying, with noticeable hit detection issues in the fight against the Vulture, for instance, but it's a fun little adventure that deserves more attention than it gets. Number 19. Spider-Man 2 – PlayStation Portable the PSP version of Spider-Man 2 has ambition, we'll give it that. It was never going to handle the large, freely explorable environments of the PlayStation 2 version, but it attempts to retain at least some of that game's spirit. Smaller, more limited open-world segments are parceled out throughout the adventure. It doesn't scratch the same itch as the PS2 original, but it's nice to see it try. 
The rest of the game consists of 2D and 3D fighting segments which the PSP is better suited to handling, but those little glimpses of city exploration are easily the most memorable parts. The game is a bit too short, a bit too easy, a bit too confusing, and far too buggy, but it's not terrible. Which isn't saying much, I know, but we're getting so much closer to the games that are actually good now and I'd like to just move along. Number 18. Spider-Man. Game Boy Color. As the PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and Dreamcast were getting a taste of a great Spider-Man adventure, developer Vicarious Visions decided the Game Boy Color should have one too. And miraculously, it's a pretty darn good one. It sounds great. Enjoy the chip-tuned version of the 1960 Spider-Man theme in the pause menu, for example. And looks genuinely impressive in the cutscenes. That would of course matter very little if it didn't play well, but it does, sort of, for, for the most part, maybe. Spider-Man controls fluidly, with clean movements and smooth animation. He's even able to swing in a far more satisfying way than should be possible on the Game Boy Color. The bad news is that his jumping is an annoyance. You're locked into a direction as soon as you press A, Castlevania-style, making Spider-Man feel far less graceful than he should. And unless you rely on projectile combat, you'll get very tired of the hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting quickly. Still, those small complaints would be resolved in... Number 17, Spider-Man 2 The Sinister Six, Game Boy Color. The fighting is better, the jumping is better, and you now have to hold down the A button rather than just press it to swing from webs, which actually goes a long way towards making the experience feel more dynamic. Also, the boss fights are improved, and if you remain still for a few seconds, giving Peter Parker a chance to concentrate, his spidey sense will kick in and show you where your objective is. It's a smart and organic in-game hint system we quite enjoyed, and it works well with the large levels here, which are designed to give players multiple paths to progress. The Game Boy Color was not a powerful system, and we'd have guessed Spider-Man games this fun would be far beyond its capabilities. This thing has open world sections, for crying out loud. It's not a game that will change your life, sure, but it will definitely give you a greater appreciation for what this little handheld could achieve. Number 16, Spider-Man 2, Enter Electro, PlayStation. Enter Electro isn't great, but it's also by no means bad. It's just mediocre, stuck in between two much better games it can't possibly live up to. Spider-Man PS1 from the year previous, and Spider-Man PS2, which came out about six months later. Compared to both of these games, Enter Electro feels unnecessary. It looked really great for a PS1 game, and the soundtrack is stellar, but Spider-Man himself controls like he's in the late stages of arthritis, and new New York feels bland and lifeless. There could be a reason for that latter fact, however. Enter Electro was redesigned after the 9-11 terrorist attacks that brought down the World Trade Center, a location that figured prominently in the game's original design. How much these understandable changes affected the experience, we can't know for sure, but the developers definitely had to come up with some workarounds to some extent, and the final game certainly feels that way. Number 15, Spider-Man 3, Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. One thing we appreciate about Spider-Man 3 is that while it's recognizably faithful to the film of the same name, it puts forth a lot of effort to craft several shorter stories of its own using unique characters. One thing we don't appreciate about Spider-Man 3 is the rest of it. Okay, that's a bit harsh, but the game is frustrating because of how much better it should be. It was developed by Treyarch, the same developer as the previous two movie games, but either their heart wasn't in it this time, or they all suffered concussions at the same moment and forgot what they were doing. The controls are less precise, the camera less helpful, and the character models and animations represent a huge step backwards. It has enough in common design-wise with its far superior predecessor that it's not a complete waste of time, but we definitely wish it had built on that game's accomplishments rather than turning into a lesser imitation of them. Number 14, Spider-Man Edge of Time, 3DS, PlayStation 3, Wii, and Xbox 360. Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2099 team up to solve a cross-generational crisis, which they accomplish by beating people up and collecting keys. So, you know, almost exactly the same as most other games on this list then. 
The developers even coined the phrase quantum causality to describe the gameplay. Or perhaps they coined it to trick people into thinking the gameplay was far more interesting than it actually was. What happens in Edge of Time is what happens in any time travel story. Changing something in the past affects the future, but in Edge of Time, it tends to happen passively. You control one version of Spider-Man performing an action, and the other tells you in voiceover what changed. Not very exciting stuff. It's repetitive, and critics griped rightfully about the out-of-character behaviour of Peter Parker. Even the opportunity to play as two different versions of Spider-Man isn't impressive, especially since Shattered Dimensions, released the previous year, allowed us to play as four versions. Number 13, Ultimate Spider-Man, Game Boy Advance. The Game Boy Advance excelled at comic book style graphics, and Ultimate Spider-Man plays to that strength perfectly. It looks and sounds great, and gives Spider-Man an impressive amount of options for both movement and combat, making it feel suitably specific to the character. And while it's nice to see a game that captures Spider-Man's abilities so well, it's even nicer to see one that captures his specific weaknesses. Spider-Man can go head-to-head -head against his foes in this game, but he'll nearly always take a beating in the process. Process. At least that's the case unless you fight strategically. Spidey's strengths in this game are in his agility, and keeping on the move during combat is a must. It's a great design choice that forces you to play like Spider-Man, rather than simply pound away at buttons. It's also fun, something that really shouldn't be worth mentioning, but well, you've seen some of the other nonsense on this list, so that's actually a big plus. Number 12, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, DS. The DS version of Shattered Dimensions will never see the same level of appreciation as the main console game, and actually that's fine as it's nowhere near as good, but it does deserve at least some degree of recognition. This version completely reimagines the experience as a Metroidvania, something Nintendo's handheld systems have nearly always done well. Unfortunately, this version of Shattered Dimensions just about trips over its own gimmick. Whereas the console version famously brought four versions of Spider-Man together, this one has only three, leaving out Ultimate Spider-Man entirely. It's also extremely short, clocking in at around five hours if you take your time. Still, the combat is good, and if you're a fan of both Spider-Man and the genre in general, this is an easy recommendation. Number 11, Spider-Man Web of Shadows, PlayStation 3, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC. In the majority of these games, Spider-Man has to prevent tragedy. And, you know, that's good because it's kind of his job. In Web of Shadows, however, tragedy has already struck. New York is infested with symbiotes. He and others, not all of them friendly, fight desperately to beat back the invasion, with the odds stacked massively against them. It's a moodier and more atmospheric approach, and it works very well. It even ties into the gameplay, with Spider-Man's black suit serving as both a necessary tool for battle and an example of the darkening end of his morality. From a narrative standpoint, this could easily have been the best Spider-Man game, to be honest. But unfortunately, the narrative is all that the game gets truly right. The morality system that was central to the game's plot is sadly quite limited, the gameplay and objectives get repetitive quickly, and the camera seems to be working for the symbiotes, considering how uncooperative it is. Fans should seek this game out, certainly, but they should also know going in that it won't live up to its own high promise. Number 10, Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin, Mega Drive, and Sega CD. Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin is not much in the looks department, but it plays well, with an impressive amount of grace in Spider-Man's movements when he's swinging from webs and climbing buildings. He's a bit less impressive on the ground, but, you know, deliberately or not, that suits the character, and it encourages the player to actually experiment with the abilities that made him famous. Whenever you need a break from kicking seven shades of Fisk out of the bad guys, you can take photos of them for extra cash, a long overdue nod to Peter's day job. There are also smaller crimes you can stop on your way to larger objectives. It's a nice way to actually portray the character as your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, as opposed to some video game character who murders the citizens of New York one by one. If you're looking for an early console game that does Spider-Man any justice whatsoever as a character, this is one to seek out. Number 9, Spider-Man 3, PS2, PSP, and Wii. 
We're as surprised as you are that the version of Spider-Man 3 released for these systems is better than the one released for the PS3, 360 and PC, but hey, here we are. Here, the rival gangs fight for control of New York, and it's up to you to help the police claim it back. A nice way of feeling as though your actions are making a difference. You earn the black suit much earlier in this version and can switch between costumes more or less at will. Weirdly, even the cutscenes look better here. Whether or not they actually look good is a matter of taste, but they at least look like the polygons fit together. Without question, the city feels far less lively here than on those more powerful systems, but that trade-off leads to a smoother experience, which begs the question, is this version of Spider-Man 3 much better than it should have been or is the HD version just that much worse? Number 8. The Amazing Spider-Man 3DS, PlayStation 3, Vita, Wii, Wii U, Xbox 360, and PC Serving as a sort of alternate universe follow-up to the film, The Amazing Spider-Man is destined to be mainly of interest to fans of the movie. It should also, however, be of interest to fans of Marvel's Spider-Man for the PS4, as a number of ideas in this game would be refined and improved on for that one. This includes the faux social media feed that updates as the game progresses, collectibles and costumes from Spidey's history, and an early attempt at borrowing the celebrated combat from Rocksteady's Arkham series. And before anyone gets upset with us for drawing that comparison, the developers themselves cited Arkham Asylum and Arkham City as direct inspiration. So, you know, settle down. The 3DS and Wii ports are largely the same as the other versions, but notable differences include the controls and lack of an explorable open world, because hey, who wants an open world in a Spider-Man game anyway? <laughs> we can't imagine that ever catching on. Number 7. Spider-Man PlayStation, Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, and PC The earliest Spider-Man game most people remember fondly is 2000's Spider-Man for the PlayStation. Making the necessary allowances for the early Polygon era, we think the game holds up quite well. The web-slinging is smooth, Spider-Man's agility comes through perfectly, and the soundtrack by esteemed video game composer Tommy Tallarico is better than we mortals deserve. Many of the voices from the 1990s Spider-Man cartoon reprised their roles for this game, and there's even narration by some weird, virtually unknown voice actor named Stan Lee. So get ready for a true superhero action thriller, packed to the brim with thrills and chills, twists and turns. <laughs> wonder who that guy is. The Nintendo 64 version has improved loading times, as you might expect, but also you lose the FMVs and a significant chunk of music quality. The Dreamcast version got better models and textures, however, so that's definitely the way to go if you're one of the 11 people who still owns a Dreamcast. Number 6. Spider-Man GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC Often referred to as Spider-Man The Movie, this one still holds up well today. The game shines its brightest when Spider-Man is allowed to swing from building to building, exploring bits of New York that honestly look quite good considering the hardware limitations of the time. In fact, it's worth spending as much time as possible simply enjoying these moments of freedom, as the game itself is quite short, clocking in at well under five hours. It also, however, has a fairly terrible camera, and controlling Spider-Man in the narrow indoor sections is nightmarish, but these things don't hurt the experience much, and it's a game that clearly had a lot of love invested in it. Its development. Of course, just about any complaint is balanced out by the great Bruce Campbell's narration in the tutorial, a role he'd reprise in the game's two sequels. Number 5. Spider-Man The Video Game Arcade Sega's 1991 Spider-Man arcade game is still one of Spidey's strongest outings. It's a relic from the golden age of arcade co-op, and it holds up beautifully. Its visuals are great, its combat satisfying, and its stages are just varied enough to keep the experience from growing stale. It supports up to four players as well, which greatly increases the fun factor. Black Cat, Hawkeye, and Submariner are the other playable characters, each one of whom comes with their own attacks and abilities. Unlike some of this game's contemporaries, the Simpsons, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and X-Men, for instance, Spider-Man the arcade game doesn't seem to come up as frequently in nostalgic reverie. That's unfortunate, because it deserves to be held in about as high a regard. Number 4. Ultimate Spider-Man GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC 
With the possible exception of the PS4 game, Ultimate Spider-Man might have the best story of any game on this list. And that shouldn't be surprising, as Brian Michael Bendis, who co-wrote the Ultimate Spider-Man comic, wrote this game. As a result, the characters are true to themselves, funny, and feel like they're part of a coherent universe. That's nice and all, but it wouldn't matter much if the gameplay were disappointing, and fortunately, it is not. Players control either Spider-Man or Venom at various points in the story, and they both feel unique. Additionally, the stylized graphics have aged better than most games of its era, and the voice acting is surprisingly strong. I envy you guys. You're happy just with some walking cliches. Seriously, good for you. But come on, guys, leave the lady alone. Ultimate Spider-Man isn't celebrated as much as a certain PS2 sibling, but it's definitely worth a spin, which is what a spider does. It spins webs. Please clap. Number 3. Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions – PlayStation 3, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC When Shattered Dimensions was announced, anticipation was high. Not one, not two, not three, not five, but four versions of Spider-Man playable in a single game, each with their own worlds, mechanics, and visual styles. It was either going to be too ambitious for its own good, or it was going to be one of the best Spider-Man games ever made. Miraculously, it ended up being the latter. How the developers of the B-Movie game came this far this fast is beyond my ability to comprehend. After a battle with Mysterio, in which Spider-Man punches a hole through the fabric of reality, which is kind of the most villainous act in this game, but you do you, Spidey, it's up to the Amazing Spider-Man, Ultimate Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2099, and Spider-Man Noir to restore balance. The adventure that follows is uneven, admittedly, but it's carried by how fun and creative it is. Number 2. Spider-Man 2 – GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox For a small group of fans, Spider-Man 2 is still the best Spider-Man game ever. We respectfully disagree, but we do understand the enduring love for and appeal of this PS2-era web-slinging adventure. It was the very first game to get the feeling of swinging around New York exactly right, giving us the truly enjoyable open-world experience we always knew Spider-Man could deliver. Taking off the nostalgia goggles, we can admit that the graphics haven't aged all that gracefully and the combat is largely mindless, but those things do very little to hamper the enjoyment of this game all these years later. The city is still impressive in its size and density, and we actually got to feel like a hero, swinging down from the rooftops to clobber street thugs, rush somebody to hospital, or simply be a pizza delivery boy. You know, the real heroes of the world. Pizza time. It says a lot that Spider-Man 2 remained untouched as the greatest Spider-Man adventure for so long. All the way, actually, until 2018's offering, which was, number one, Marvel's Spider-Man, PlayStation 4. It really had to end this way, didn't it? The PlayStation 4 exclusive Spider-Man game is a masterpiece. The exploration, the combat, the voice acting, the story, everything is just perfect. Sorry to cook and run. Did... did you just leave your clothes on the kitchen floor? Uh... And the entire game is littered with things to discover, to the point that a number of YouTubers have dedicated videos to doing nothing but sightseeing. We've seen bigger open worlds, but very few that have felt this real, this cohesive, and this alive. And that's just the superficial stuff. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is every bit as satisfying as we could hope as well. Whether that's getting joyously lost while searching for collectibles, stopping street crime, meeting adoring fans, or just swinging through the city, everything fits perfectly together into the definitive Spider-Man experience. And Insomniac deserves massive credit for developing the gameplay of the Arkham series for Spider-Man rather than simply lifting it wholesale. Marvel's Spider-Man shares a lot of of Arkham's DNA, but it's impossible to argue that it doesn't feel perfectly at home here and at one with the stellar quality of the game itself. Marvel's Spider-Man isn't just the best Spider-Man game, it's one of the best superhero games of all time. And there you have it, every Spider-Man game ranked from worst to best. Do you have a personal favourite you think should have been ranked higher? Do you think there were any high entries that should have been ranked lower? 
If you could be bitten by something radioactive, what would it be and why? Let us know in the comments below. Also, if you have any suggestions for other Every X ranked from worst to best videos, give us a shout. If we like your idea, we might just pretend we came up with it ourselves. You can follow Triple Jump on Twitter here, and while you're at it, why not support the things you enjoy by having a look at our Patreon? Finally, don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Peter. And I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and thanks for watching.